So I prepared just a type of uh, introductory talk on phenotyping, uh, trying not to overlap with what my colleagues uh, already told yesterday and probably will uh, detail also a little bit later. Uh, so this is the outline of the talk and I will start with some uh, background information. Uh, the aim of a grape grower and a winemaker is of course to maintain and to improve the economical uh, sustain sustainability of his business. And to this end, uh, he may use a lot of uh, vit viticultural uh, practices. Some of them are shown here. I didn't show spraying because it's not very popular. But uh, to guide this uh, vineyard management, it's uh, very important to have some uh, decision uh, uh, support system. So the viticultural practices may affect the development of uh, the plant, of course, the sink source uh, relationship, the fertilization and so on. So the physiological status of a plant. It will affect also or try to affect uh, dissemination and the spread of the uh, pathogens. And by uh, trimming the plant, uh, by also adjusting the plantation density and so on, the viticulturist also acts on the microclimate, which is very important for the quality of the berry and also for the impact of the diseases. So everything is linked in this system. And uh, so it's very important to have uh, decision support uh, tools and these uh, decision support tools are based on information that is collected on the three uh, parameters which are shown here. So of course the climate and the microclimate when it's possible, the plant physiological status and the dissemination of the pathogens, the abundance of the pathogens. So to design these uh, decision support systems. We rely on phenotyping, especially when we focus at the plant, and this is the point where phenotyping is very important. So phenotyping is uh, able to give a good, good account of physiological traits, and so it's uh, transformed into proxies that must be uh, accurate, cheap, and uh, real reliable. And these proxies are used to elaborate, to design uh, models. So we will have an example of that uh, in the next talk, I think, by uh, Zhang Wudai. And these models are them themselves used to derive decision-making tools, systems. And of course, the models must have a predictive value. So they must be able to predict the physiological traits of a grapevine. And so there is a, a loop which is uh, done to validate the model and to improve them. And so the models are uh, calibrated and validated before they are used for decision support, support system. So we may use a lot of different uh, phenotyping uh, devices and phenotyping is is a, a general definition, is the collection of uh, a set of characters on a large number of organisms, and these characters are analyzed, their variability is analyzed in the context of a genetic and environmental background. So the aim is to understand the effects of genotype and environment interaction, and this may, may be used by breeders, modelers, and of course, agronomists. So the characters are very wide in nature. They can be uh, molecular, so it may start from a description of, of a genome. But of course, it may also include uh, cell parameters or molecular parameters like the transcriptome, the metabolome, the proteome. But all this, in the end, will uh, control a uh, physiological uh, trait. And so the basis, the start is the genome, but the expression of a character is through the physiological trait. And so phenotyping could cover everything in this, uh, in this uh, definition. Uh, it's very important to report very accurately the uh, experimental conditions and unfortunately it's not yet done very, uh, very often. So we need to define of course the climate but also the soil 
the rootstock, most of the time it's forgotten, uh, the way the vine is conducted and so on. So it's very important because if we do not have all this information, uh, most of the uh, phenotyping data will not be completely useful. And so it's very important. And uh, there is uh, an emerging awareness of uh, this uh, notion that we should uh, be able to uh, phenotype very extensively uh, the plants in the field from the molecular to the physiological uh, uh, aspect and also to use uh, uh, databases which would be able to integrate all the types of information we will retrieve from this uh, phenotyping. So this was for example uh, pinpointed by the paper of uh, Melanie Vivier and co-workers which was called uh, Fieldomics or something in uh, Frontiers in Plant Science. This is also the reason why uh, Mario Pezzotti and some uh, of our colleagues here, so, and Francoise, are trying to push uh, a cost uh, proposal for integrate omics. And uh, this is also the reason why, uh, and Francoise and uh, many here in the audience uh, collaborated to a collective paper which is now in press in uh, horticultural research. And the idea is that we, we really need a grape information system to uh, analyze all the data which are collected. Phenotyping can also be done at a very different scale, starting from the, the cell, the organ, such as the leaf, the, the canopy, the plot, the estate, and the, the AOC. So we have a different type of uh, scales, micro, local, meso, or macro scales. Of course, I will not uh, cover everything in my, in my talk. I will concentrate mainly on the uh, phenotyping of the vegetative development of the berry and uh, some slides also about uh, disease uh, incidence or disease uh, monitoring. And I will not uh, talk about the phenotyping of a rootstock. Rootstock is very important, but most of the time it's uh, neglected and forgotten. But it's a good, good thing that I do not talk about this because it's a topic which is very difficult, so there is not, mu not much less done on uh, rootstock phenotyping. So it's even more complicated than to phenotype the aerial system. So uh, in the project in Innovine, uh, various tools were uh, used. So fluorescence, laser, reflectance, image analysis, infrared spectroscopy, hyperspectral imaging, uh, thermal remote sensing, and, uh, and so on. But I will uh, concentrate here on the five uh, top uh, uh, tools, and so to give some, uh, some details. And this has been, has been used to uh, phenotype the physiological traits which are listed here, so growth, figure, phenology, yield and berry composition. So I will start with uh, fluorescence. So there, there is a wide range of uh, uh, sensors which are now able to work uh, and to uh, give some information on the plant phenotyping. Some of these sensors are using uh, uh, active uh, radiation, so we use an artificial light source, so this is uh, fluorescence. Some are passive, and so they are based on the natural light sources, and so they are mainly used uh, using uh, reflectance. The working distance may be uh, very different also. We had al already some views about it in the previous talk. So it may be by contact, or short distance, or medium distance, or it can be drone or satellite. So we can also uh, monitor the phenotype of a plant because of uh, several compounds which are able to absorb some uh, light radiations, so phenolics, carotenoids, anthocyanins, chlorophyll, and so on. So uh, the multiplex uh, sensor, which has been used in many, uh, many labs in uh, work package one, uh, is uh, uh, able to be handheld or it can be mounted and it was used mainly in the project to monitor uh, leaf development and also uh, berry, berry uh, composition. 
In our lab in Bordeaux, we used the multiplex sensor to monitor uh, mainly this uh, plot, which is called uh, VitAdapt. And it's a plot uh, that we planted in 2009. It's including uh, 52 varieties. This doesn't work. Yes, 52 varieties, so 30 red varieties, 20 uh, white varieties, and uh, two hybrids, I think. And it's uh, divided in five independent blocks. Uh, each plant is uh, represented by uh, each uh, variety is represented by uh, 50 plants, so five blocks of 10 plants. And all plants are uh, grafted on the same rootstock, SO4. So these plants uh, differ very widely by the phenology, as shown here by the mid horizon date on the right. And so we phenotyped this plant for many uh, different parameters. And uh, here I show an example of what has been done for the biomass uh, index using the multiplex sensor at different uh, uh, times of uh, development. So Bloom was at week uh, 20 four and we went up to week uh, 25 and so here in red you have a high uh, biomass and in uh, uh, blue you have a low biomass what can be shown here uh, is that uh, it's very important to use a, a block system because even if you have a collection uh, where you have the collection planted on a single block you may have a different uh, responses so, for example, this block clearly differs for the, from the block which is uh, right uh, next to him. And so if you phenotype only a block on a collection, you are not sure of a, of a result. Uh, here you have also three uh, varieties which were investig investigated in more detail during the project. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Tempranillo, and Riesling. And of course, they are randomly uh, dispatched in the blocks. Uh, we also phenotype, for example, the nitrogen uh, balance index. And so here, the, when you have the red uh, spots, you have high nitro nitrogen. And you see that along the season, you have uh, differences. And here, for example, there was a uh, rainfall just before the measurements. So this uh, rainfall uh, stimulated nitrogen uh, uptake. And so we have a switch from uh, uh, yellow and green color to, to red colors. Uh, we also use the, the multiplex sensor to monitor the, the berries. And so here you have a Cabernet Sauvignon a measurement when uh, made on, on grapes in the, in the field. So three years, uh, 2013, 14, and uh, 15. And you can see that in the year 2013, the weather was uh, cold and rainy. So this delayed the, the, the ripening, the anthocyanin content. And uh, we have a very good correlation between the uh, field measurements and measurements made on the uh, detached berries in the lab. We have the same uh, delay here for the uh, year 2013. And here you have the same for Tempranillo, which was another uh, variety included in the assay. Here you have uh, measurements of uh, chlorophyll on uh, uh, white varieties. So this is... Uh, Chardonnay, and this is a uh, Riesling on the right panel. And again, in 2013, you have a, a delay due to the climatic conditions. And again, a very good correlation between the field measurements and lab measurements. So altogether, uh, there was a very good correlation between field and uh, lab measurements made uh, uh, for anthocyanins and for chlorophyll content. So more recently, uh, Force A developed uh, this uh, tool, which is called uh, Cuba, a converter of units for berry anthocyanins, because the multiplex de delivers uh, results which are done, uh, uh, given in a millivolt. And of course, for the grape grower, it's much more interesting to have uh, 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 anthocyanin content expressed on a berry basis, volume basis, or gram basis. So this is now available from uh, Force A. Uh, in uh, G2, 
GKI, uh, the multiplex was used for different uh, uh, objectives. It was used to assess the infection by Donny mildew. And uh, again, uh, they compared, so this is the group of uh, Reiner Topfer and Anna Kircherer, they compared this greenhouse data with uh, field data. So for the greenhouse, they used uh, 10, pot 10 potent plants. Uh, they compared the five plants uh, as control, five plants which were inoculated. Uh, they made daily measurements for 14 days on both sides of the leaf, so adax adaxial and uh, abaxial. And of course, the same leaves were uh, recorded for the whole duration of the experiment. So there was a nice contrast between uh, Muller Turgo, which is a sus susceptible to the Donny mildew, and uh, Regent, which is resistant. And uh, you can see that in uh, Muller Turgo, you have uh, a strong increase in uh, fluorescence, uh, especially on the uh, abaxial size, uh, side of, of the leaf, while you don't have any uh, fluorescence uh, response for the uh, Regent variety. Uh, so the conclusion is that uh, down in mildew infection uh, time course can be monitored in situ with this uh, multiplex uh, device. There is a clear difference between uh, diseased vines and healthy vines. And the first uh, significant signals are detectable after five days, after inoculations, five or six days. In the field, uh, six varieties were uh, Monitored, so Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon, these are susceptible varieties, red and white. Solaris and Regent, resilient varieties, and uh, uh, other varieties which are highly resilient. So 40 leaves per variety were uh, assessed at two different heights and uh, on two different sides of a canopy. Measurements started in beginning of June until the uh, infection was uh, complete, total. So two measurements were made per week on both sides of uh, the leaf again. And again, the same leaves were monitored through the, the trial. Again, there is a strong uh, increase in fluorescence uh, after infection of uh, sensitive uh, varieties. Here you have uh, Chardonnay. But uh, we don't have a lot of differences between uh, healthy and infected leaves for the different uh, levels of uh, resistant uh, varieties. So for the field experiment, the conclusion is that uh, it's possible to uh, monitor this uh, infection with a uh, uh, multiplex uh, MX330. Uh, uh, the healthy Leaves of uh, susceptible varieties are clearly different from the resistant, uh, from the infected leaves. Uh, so control and uh, healthy leaves, strong differences. Uh, but we don't have so much differences between the different levels of uh, resistance uh, uh, that were uh, monitored with this uh, device. And so it's more or less a yes or no response, and the response is higher on the abaxial side of the leaf and the, on the adaxial side of the leaf. So probably there is some need again for improvement here. So now I'll switch to PhysioCAP. Uh, it's another tool which is uh, uh, sold by Force A. And the uh, basis of the tool is a laser-based device uh, which is able to uh, give an estimation of uh, cane vigor and uh, so it's based on the fact that uh, you have a laser beam and when the laser beam uh, is uh, cut by a, a cane, when it meets a cane, you have a signal which may be uh, used by the, the uh, device. So you have several situations with a lower high number of canes and small and large diameter of canes. And uh, so this is the device, uh, it can be mounted on different uh, uh, tractors, so regular tractor, high clearance tractor, or a, a quad. So 
the rows were monitored every five meters, which was con considered to give uh, enough pre precision for the measurement. And this is the type of map you, you get. So the indices which are measured are the cane diameter on a, a surface or plant basis, the cane number on a surface or plant basis. And from this, you can deduce the mean weight of the pruned wood. Uh, also, uh, after calibration with a uh, visual inspection. And so here you have uh, again a mapping of uh, cane di diameter, cane number, and so the wood, wood weight. At the bottom line, on the bottom line, the contrasting uh, image is higher, so you have a higher contrast. So from this type of map, uh, the grape grower can be uh, guided in, in, a, in his uh, vertical practices because it's able to, we are able to distinguish a four situation with a low diameter and low number of, of canes. So this corresponds to low vigor, so it's important to fertilize. Here you have high di diameter but low number of cane, so it's uh, better to prune longer. And so you have the two other situations where you can have, for example, very high diameter and high number of canes, so, which means that the vigor is very high, so probably the nitrogen is unbalanced, so it's better to do, to do some uh, cover crop. Now reflectance, this has been uh, developed by the lab of uh, Osvaldo Feila and uh, Laura Ustioni in uh, Milano. And the uh, reflectance is based on the fact that uh, you have a specific uh, spectra due to the content and to the abundance of uh, several uh, uh, molecules in the leaves or in the plant. And so instead of recording fluorescence, you record the reflectance. Uh, this raises a number of prob problems, potential problems on which uh, Laura spent a lot of time because you may have a saturation, you may have a overlapping between the, the spectra and so on. So she had to, to work hard to, to make this uh, uh, reliable. But she used this to, for different topics, which I will show uh, on the next slide. But she also used the uh, dyes to color some specific compounds, for example, polyphenols. And so we extend the possibilities of using this uh, reflectance spectra for phenotyping. The main results she got uh, concerned the uh, sunburn effects and uh, she showed mainly that uh, some sunburn sy symptoms are not only due to, to heat but rather to photooxidation uh, reaction. Uh, she also developed that to study ripening and also to study uh, water stress for example, she was able to show that uh, woody uh, tissues uh, pigmentation is changing uh, uh, when the plants are water stress, and this could be monitored by reflectance uh, spectroscopy. So the stem composition appears to change in relation to drought tolerance. There are a number of future, future applications uh, which may be envisaged because this system is uh, cheap it's only 5,000 euros. Uh, during the duration of the project, uh, significant uh, improvements have been made and uh, several impro improvements can be expected. And using uh, uh, color coloring substances, it may be possible to use this uh, type of approach to monitor uh, various compounds in the plants. And this can be done on uh, solid assays, which avoids the artifacts due to extraction. So this uh, new type of approach can be used for high throughput phenotyping. Uh, in the group of uh, Javier Tardaguila, uh, they used the image analysis and the goal was to assess the number of flowers on the inflorescence using a machine vision uh, model, uh, which could be implemented on a smart phone. They also developed uh, the same type of device for uh, the berries, but uh, I think Javier will talk about the berries a little bit later, probably tomorrow. 
So the app is designed in such a way that you, you just take a picture from the inflorescence and there is an algorithm, algorithm which will uh, uh, undertake several steps uh, and finally give you the number of uh, flowers. So from the original image, the software is able to extract the flower candidates and then to uh, withdraw to subtract the false positive after filtering. So this, good, this gives a very good correlation between uh, the image analysis and the actual number of flowers which are counted. So it's an important component of yield, of course, to know uh, the number of flowers and then the number of berries. So infrared spectroscopy, uh, this was used uh, in, in our lab in Bordeaux and this was combined with a multiplex also. This was used again on the VitaDapt plot because this plot uh, contains uh, 2,600 uh, plants that we have to uh, phenotype quickly. So this uh, is done in the uh, context of climate change and this plot was planted uh, with the support of the Bordeaux wine industry, Conseil Interprofessionnel du Van Bordeaux, in the context of uh, adaptation to climate change. And now we have another plot, which is called uh, Gref Adapt, where we have done the same. We have planted 55 uh, different rootstocks. They are all uh, grafted by five uh, varieties, and we have uh, 15 plants for each combination. So for this plot, we have about 4,600 plants to phenotype. And so we will develop this uh, later because the Gref Adapt plot was only planted uh, last year. Anyway, with a multiplex, there is a very good correlation between the measurements which are made uh, in the lab on the anthocyanin and flavonol contents on red and white varieties and with the measurements we are which are made by the fluorescence uh, sensor. So it's possible to have this type of map. And for the VitaDapt, we also used it uh, uh, for uh, monitoring of berries in the lab, so on detached berries. And there is a good correlation, again, uh, between the chemical measurements and the measurements which are made in the lab. Because on field, you are not able to monitor everything in, in the same time. And we combine that with a wine scan, which is an infrared Fourier transformation analyzer, usually uh, used to monitor the uh, composition of a wine. It's very quick because it takes only uh, 30 seconds for the analysis. And we adapted it to analyze the berry juices from the berries that were collected in the VitaDapt plot. So after calibration, this uh, uh, wine scan got a very good account of uh, major parameters in the berry composition. Uh, and yes, this track, who did that with uh, Keith Van Leven uh, uh, since several years now, uh, told me last week that we, have, uh, we can also use this to monitor the potassium content, but it's not uh, really allowable for the yeast assimilable uh, nitrogen. So what is important with this type of measurement is first to, first to calibrate the, the, the apparatus and you have to calibrate it every year, so it takes some time. But this allowed us, for example, to uh, separate uh, the varieties uh, according to the acidity or according to the sugar content, according also to the berry weight. So now we have a lot of data which we still didn't have time to analyze, so these are punctual data from uh, one year, I think, but now we have data from uh, four or five years, and so we have a lot of info information that we just start to, to analyze. And uh, this is also an example which I think is interesting in terms of uh, showing the genetic uh, diversity that we have in the rate and the amount of uh, sugar accumulation between uh, different genotypes. Because of course uh, now many people complain that we have too much sugars in the berries and so we have too much sugar in the alcohol and so we would like to identify the physiological traits and the genes uh, which are responsible of uh, low sugar accumulation or delayed sugar accumulation.
So our conclusions uh, is that we have many phenotyping approaches which may be used and are in constant uh, progress. We have been using some of them in uh, work package one in the Innovine project. They allowed the monitoring of grape development, ripening and the impact of uh, disease. And they can be used for modeling. This will be part of a talk uh, next after me. And uh, hopefully also they are useful for uh, designing better decision support systems. Future uh, developments may be expected in uh, geopositioning. So the aim is to be able to monitor uh, the physiological status of a plant, uh, plant by plant. And uh, in my lab, we will soon uh, buy a RTK uh, uh, beacon to be able to do that. Uh, there are also a lot of improvements, I think, that may be expected from uh, hyperspectral imaging. And maybe Javier Tardaguila will speak about this later. All these devices can be mounted uh, on robots, uh, driven by man or automatic robots. And during the, the time of the project, there was also significant improvements done by uh, drone imaging. We didn't use drones or very little in the project, but uh, from what I've heard, within four years, there were uh, very good improvements in what could be expected from a drone uh, use for uh, grapevine phenotyping. And again, uh, we really need to put a major efforts on uh, databases. And I think it's uh, very important. Uh, it would require a very important uh, international effort, but it's uh, really uh, necessary. Otherwise, we will have a lot of uh, uh, dispersed data everywhere, but we want to uh, uh, withdraw all the information that we could withdraw from this uh, data. So thank you. Ah. Last slide. My co-workers. So from work page one.